Hello everyone. This is the first lecture of uh, a series of lectures that I'm giving uh, this semester and uh, the publisher um, Cystasis Press has uh, agreed to host on their site. Uh, this is the book I'm using. I'm using my book Unified Architectural Theory, Form, Language and Complexity and it's a companion to Christopher Alexander's the Nature of Order, Volume 1, The Phenomenon of Life. So we will use this book and, of course, Alexander's book, The Nature of Order, Volume 1, The Phenomenon uh, of Life. Uh, my book, uh, ec extracts from the book are available free online, hosted by uh, Arch Daily, and I will uh, provide links to those uh, every week that, that we have uh, the readings. And uh, this series of lectures will just uh, discuss uh, some complementary material and, and questions about the course. So, um, uh, I'm, I'm very happy. This is January uh, 2021. I'm very happy that uh, this book, um, Unified Architectural Theory, was just uh, chosen by uh, Arch Daily uh, in, in the Spanish uh, version of Arch Daily, which is Plataforma Arquitectura was chosen uh, among the 28 most important books available in Spanish. And uh, I'm honored because that list includes Vitruvius, Palladio, uh, Alberti. Uh, even though my book is, uh, is not about uh, classical and Ro Roman architecture. Okay, um, we begin the course by asking what is architectural theory? Is the slogan form follows language architectural theory? And the answer is no because it, it is not enough instructions to help somebody design a nice house or a nice kitchen or a nice restaurant, okay? It is just too brief. It's not enough. Uh, an architectural theory needs uh, two, three, four pages, okay? Uh, you need to have some meat behind architectural theory, just like a theory in, in physics and chemistry and biology. A theory has to have some meat to it. Uh, in order to help design and uh, the criterion throughout the course and throughout Alexander's work is that success depends upon the, um, the uh, well-being of the user of the building. Nothing to do with flashiness or winning architectural prizes or becoming extremely rich. A success will be judged strictly by uh, the user, does the user feel comfortable uh, doing what they need to do, performing the function uh, inside the building? Uh, uh, do they feel um, uh, healthy uh, in the short run? Uh, does their health uh, um, improve uh, in the long run? Because short-term stress leads to uh, illness, physical illness in the long term. So, so these are very specific uh, criteria. Uh, for the success of a building, and then these uh, will judge the theory upon which that building is based. So, to begin with, the slogan, form follows function, you know, it's a cute slogan and may help a little bit, but it's not enough. Just, just the size of the instruction is not enough. Now, um, is post-occupancy evaluation an architectural theory? The answer is no. But post-occupancy evaluation is uh, intimately related to what we're talking about. Because you, uh, you come up, say, with a theory, or you, you take a theory of architecture, of design, and you apply it, and you design a building. And then after the building is standing, then you perform a post-occupancy evaluation, and you see, do the users feel comfortable in it? Uh, are they healthy using it? Uh, do they get sick over the long term? Uh, well... At the moment, post-occupancy evaluation does not consider things of such depth, but it could. And, and I hope that we'll have a resurgence of post-occupancy evaluation. So, so um, this is a, a, an experimental method to gather data that then go back and tell you whether the theory you use to, uh, to uh, produce this building is a good theory or not. So already you see uh, in the first five minutes of this course, uh, I'm leading towards criteria for judging theories, because you can have different theories. And um, some theories will be judged as good, because they provide good human 
environments for living and working, and other theories could be judged as bad if they uh, give rise to anxiety or illness, uh, or a difficult uh, difficult to use. Okay, create a building is difficult to use. So this is these are very particular uh, and and precise criteria. Now, uh, post occupancy evaluation. Uh, uh, it used to be very, very strong 30 years ago, and uh, has not. Uh, people don't use it very much uh, nowadays. Uh, nevertheless, I want to uh, let everyone know who is listening to this that today, outside of architecture, we have enormously powerful new techniques where you have psychological and medical sensors, portable sensors that you can put and wear and go and go through and get a, a, a post-occupancy evaluation that is a thousand times more accurate than the old times when you, you, you had three people go with, with a checklist and a questionnaire and you ask them. Well, here we, we have these uh, medical sensors and you get millions of data uh, uh, that even give you uh, the unconscious uh, response of the body, which is uh, more truthful than, uh, than, than the old type of a questionnaire. So uh, today uh, we can perform a post-occupancy evaluation. It is not done so far by the architecture profession, which has gone on to uh, investigate other things, but it is uh, a central concern of product development, uh, advertising, uh, the medical field, uh, environmental psychology, uh, as applied to, to, uh, to business and, and commerce and advertising. So uh, we really have, uh, we're on the threshold of a revolution of, uh, uh, of judging architecture uh, because of these, uh, of these developments. Okay, um, are construction codes architectural theory? No, they're not. Construction codes uh, don't tell you how to do things. Construction codes just impose some um, measures or dimensions or, uh, uh, or standards on what you build, and uh, those uh, may be useful or those may uh, stop your creativity, uh, constrain you in some way. We can um, uh, fix many codes that are simply wrong and misguided. For example, the Euclidean zoning, urban zoning, goes back to Euclid, Ohio, not the Euclid, Euclidean geometry or the mathematician Euclid. Euclid, Ohio, which was just outside of Cleveland, Ohio, and now it's part of Cleveland, since Cleveland has grown since the 1920s. And the Euclidean zoning tells you you have to separate the, the, uh, the functions. You have to separate residential from commercial, uh, from, uh, from everything else. Uh, that destroyed the city. Uh, it, it gave rise to, to sprawl, terrible uh, uh, traffic problems, etc., etc. So, uh, when when my friends uh, want to build a new urbanist development, which is a nice uh, mixed-use, pedestrian-friendly scale, uh, they cannot do so unless those uh, zoning codes are uh, waived. So, uh, the, the the locality has to vote a variance. Otherwise, you cannot build a living city with the present codes. Therefore, the present codes, uh, many of the present codes are just false. Now, plumbing codes are good. Electrical codes are good. They, they keep a, a, a check on, on how thick a wire you put on the wall. Otherwise, the whole thing can catch on fire. But uh, architectural and urban codes need drastic revisions. And uh, if you are, uh, if you take this course seriously, the, the course that I'm giving, then, then you will go and, and try to find out where some of these design codes come from. They come from some theory, but the theory could be totally false, or it could be somebody made it up and said, well, I think this is a good idea, but it, there is no evidence base, okay? Uh, if there is an evidence base, then we can check it scientifically. If there's no evidence base, then perhaps it was a crazy idea to begin with and uh, should be revised, okay? Uh, uh, a legal structure is there to be examined and revised in case uh, a mistake was made. So th that's, uh, that's something that, that our course has, has uh, implications for. 
Uh, now, uh, is, is modernism an architectural theory? Is postmodernism an architectural theory? Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a big question, and we are going to discuss that question uh, later when we get down to actually constructing architectural theories. And then we're going to compare how good um, the architectural theories are for creating uh, useful human environments. This is our strict criterion. I don't care about uh, flashiness or about history or about uh, uh, any other philosophical questions. I and Alexander, whom I follow, uh, care only about the health of the user and the well-being of the user uh, in such a building or uh, urban environment. Now, a very uh, useful uh, tool for um, judging an architectural theory is the external validation through consilience. Consilience is a term that was um, used by Edward Wilson. Here is his book. This is not a, a, a reading requirement in the course. Uh, I'm just using one a very brief article that he wrote, and it's available openly, and I will uh, put a link on it. So Professor Wilson um, said that a good test of whether a discipline is, uh, is correct or not, does not suffer from fundamental internal flaws, is its external consilience, where it meets next to another discipline, is there a nice join? Is there a logical join? For example, the join between chemistry and biology is a beautiful join, okay? You can cross over the border from chemistry of molecules to uh, organic molecules and then to biological structure, okay? It's a nice transition. Those are separate disciplines, but there's a nice transition. There's another transition between chemistry and physics, okay? Chemistry is molecules and atoms combining together. Uh, physics uh, looks at the inside, at, at the constituents of, of the atoms and how they, uh, uh, they can form a solid state. Uh, and, and then the elementary particles they, uh, that, that, uh, that create the atom in the first place. There's a very nice transition at the interface between chemistry and physics. So we are going to ask, is there consilience between architecture and related fields? For example, education, medicine, um, and, and other fields that, um, uh, that architecture adjoins. Uh, and here is going to be the big surprise uh, that is a very poor, if non-existent, uh, consilience. Uh, bad transition or no transition at all. Because we have many cases of, uh, of hospitals designed according to uh, architectural principles where the architects say, oh, this is a great design for a hospital. And um, you know, the doctors say, this is a terrible design for a hospital. And the patients uh, uh, do not get uh, healed so, so quickly as they could in a different type of hospital. So do the architects know what they're doing when they design hospitals? It's an open question, OK? But it's, it's, it's a revolutionary question. Let's go to education. Architects design a classroom. Uh, different classrooms for, for different age uh, uh, students for different conditions. The education people, do they um, uh, approve that this is a good classroom? In many cases, no. In many cases, the education people say this is a terrible classroom. Uh, it creates, a, it has glare. The students cannot, cannot pay attention. It creates uh, anxiety in the students. That's a bad transition between architecture and education. Uh, it does not look good for uh, for the profession if uh, there's a lack of consilience. So um, we are going to uh, address such problems head on and to ask why is there a lack of consilience and what can we do about it? Okay, so these are some of the very, very central questions that uh, I'm going to address uh, uh, in this series of lectures. And um, I hope to see you uh, about once a week. So, bye everyone.